Welcome everybody, my name is Sharon. Uh, thanks for, very much for coming to my presentation. It's called Open Source Stories Beginnings. And as you can tell from the title, it's a story. Um, I remember when I was young, I always used to think that all the most exciting and compelling stories were all imaginary, set in far off lands. But now, I'm a little more experienced in life, older, I realise that there's a lot of um, real life stories that are just as interesting and just as compelling. So I want to share an open source story with you today. So the story doesn't have an ending yet, it just has a beginning. And that the reason why it doesn't have an ending is because it's still evolving. So it's the beginning of that story that I want to share with you today. So I've broken my story into uh, a few pieces, a few chapters. Uh, the first piece is uh, an introduction. I'll tell you a little bit about my background, and, you know, my open source sort of stuff. Um, beginnings. You know, we'll look at, you know, how do you know when you started on an open source journey, right? You know, and, 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 and uh, then we'll look at sort of getting together. So this is a spoiler alert here because this piece is about you know, what happens when an open source company or startup gets acquired by a company that has more complex functionalities, most of which are not open source, right? So I see, I see a few people nodding here, right? So yeah, yeah, so this is, this is why I thought this, it might be an interesting story to share because it's something that happens. Um, so one of the things that we're we were looking for, so the next piece was, you know, look what we found. So when you get that, that mix of companies, you know, how do we coexist? You know, are there any gaps, any things that we need to do to look at to help us sort of work together and to align, right? And you can tell by the, the title that we actually found some, you know, look what we found. Um, and then it, once we found these, these gaps, these things that we need to work on, how do we start on that journey? What sort of approach do we use to start working together to actually you know, leverage all the, the, the resources and the knowledge to, that will take us to the end of the journey? So that's the, the sort of breakdown of my presentation today. So I hope I've sort of made it sound interesting and uh, that you would like to stay and, and hear the rest. So um, I'll start with an introduction, uh, a little bit about me. Do you notice anything about these photographs? <laughs> Teeth. <laughs> so I smile a lot. I'm a very happy person. I like being happy. I like being around happy people. And if people are not happy, I try and make them happy. So I'm a uh, happy person. I'm also a traveller. You might notice that my accent is a bit different. Um, I'm originally from the UK, um, but I've lived and worked in quite a few countries. So in France, in Belgium, uh, Czech Republic, New Zealand, and I'm currently based out of Stockholm in Sweden. So there's a few other countries that I haven't lived and worked in yet. So there's still a bit more time for me to sort of get around the world. Um, um, I'm a volunteer at the Apache Software Foundation and I've been involved with the Apache Software Foundation for over 14 years. Um, I've been uh, a board member at the Apache Software Foundation for the last three years, so I just got recently re-elected. So I'm really, really happy to be a part of that organisation and um, really feel privileged to help uh, that uh, open source uh, move forward. So in my day job, I work as a Director of uh, community and developer relations for uh, InstaCluster by NetApp. So my background has been IT project management. I've got like 20 years experience of that. And for most of my life, I've had to separate the open source piece from my professional uh, career because the companies that I've worked for have not been really interested in open source. So when I got the opportunity to work in open source and get paid for a day job, I mean, I jumped at it with both hands. And so that's what, what I, I, I'm working at today, and that's why I'm sort of here today working an, uh, on open source. So beginnings, let's, let's get into the story. So normally, you know, a story starts with something, you know, once upon a time, there was once uh, in a land far away, there was da 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 da. And, and the, the, the beginning actually sets the context. 
So once upon a time, how do you know when something has started? So I'm going to tell you about my once upon a time. So my once upon a time in open source. So when did my open source story start? Right? Well, I can tell you that my open source story started 14 years, 8 months, and 8 days ago. And you can say, right, how does she know? How can she be so precise about that date, that duration? And the reason I can be so precise is that 14 years, 8 months, and 8 days ago, I posted my first message to an, uh, an open source project mailing list. I did a bug report, right? And after I got, when I did that post, and there's a link to it there, somebody responded. And they said, oh yeah, Sharon, you don't know that. And because I got such a positive response, my confidence grew. I reported more bugs. I got involved in documentation. I started helping with organizing events and things like that. And now, I'm, as I say, I've been working on uh, being involved in open source for all of that time. But a thing to note, right? I can tell that I've, my story started all that time ago because I'm looking back from here, right? I'm looking back from today. And I can say, right, OK, 14 years ago, da da da, that was my first message. But what if I only sent that one message and then nothing else happened? My story would have ended then, right? So the context of the story is that there's some continuation into what's happening now, right? For an individual, I say. So let me change to a company's once upon a time. So how do you know when a company's open source story starts, right? You know, I work for, I work for a, a company. Can you use the same criteria that I used? If I work for a company and I'm doing something in open source, then the company's open source journey starts as well because I'm actually contributing something. Does that count? No, not really. Because historically, I'm not saying this is the case now, but historically, a lot of people have done open source contribution in their own time. That's nothing to do with their employer. So just by saying, hey, you contribute to open source and you work for X employer. So therefore, that employer is, is, has an open source story and is involved in open source is, is false, right? So then, you know, how do you say that a company's open source story starts, right? And I would say that it's to do with the company's values and the company's culture. So if the company says or has or communicates that open source is important and drives some business value, then that is a, a signal to the people in that company to say, right, OK, yeah. It's OK to be part of open source. It's OK to use and participate in open source. And then you build a culture of open source contribution. So that is, I would say, my sort of definition of when you can say a company's open source story starts. OK? So that's a, a little bit of theory. So um, I added it in this slide because I thought it was interesting because I've seen a, a few presentations today about, you know, hey, how people adopt open source and, and whatever. And there's generally two uh, ways, I would say, approaches that people adopt open source. And one is proactive and one is reactive, right? And I think when you're talking about corporations, they're in, in, uh, interested in uh, protecting the business, they're interested in um, um, saving money and time, having some business value. So if they know that open source can deliver some of these things, then they can be proactive and plan. Say, right, OK, yes, we, n we want to use open source. So therefore, we can put in guidelines and, and documentation and, and, and ways about how uh, our people, our developers and the people that use open source in the company can, can interact with open source. So being proactive. And the key things that companies are really involved in or are concerned about is the risk mitigation. And I think, you know, Paul mentioned it in his, in, in his talk as well. You know, compliance and risk, risk compliance. So that's a proactive approach. So going, if effectively spending money up front to make sure that you're protected, that the people know what they can do and what they can't do and how they can use open source within the company. The reactive approach 
is the more around, hey, you know, ah, oh, social pressure, ah, oh, this is the latest tech, let's try it, you know, with no sort of feeling or no planning around how it's going to affect the company. This fear of missing out, you know, hey, right, okay, we, we uh, you know, our competitors are using such and such, but we're not, let's get it before they, you know, we, we miss out on this stuff. And I, I didn't put one here, but that one of them could be, you know, hey, you have a, a, an audit and you suddenly find that you've got open source in your, in your, in your stack and you didn't realise it. I mean, that's reactive, you know? Hey, so we need to be, uh, uh, companies need to, be, need to understand and plan rather than, uh, than uh, adapt to uh, something, something that's uh, bad that's happened. So that's the sort of the theory around the start of the, some of these journeys. So, so now that I'm, we, I've talked a little bit about the theory, what I want to do is talk to you about real life, right? So I hope this is a bit more interesting and I hope you can sort of connect with this. So, Instacluster and NetApp. So I don't know if you know the names of these companies. Um, so I remember I mentioned that I got my dream job uh, uh, working in open source. Right. I went to work for uh, an Australian company, uh, Instacosta, um, where I work on uh, developer relations and, and community. Um, and Instacosta, they were founded in 2012, 2013, and the, the, the solutions they, they provided were based on open source. So effectively, they prov provided some sort of managed, they provide managed services based on external projects. And some of those projects are at the Apache Software Foundation. So it's important for them to participate and be in, involved in the projects because they don't, whoops, <laughs> they don't control those projects. Those projects are community driven, but their business depends on it. So therefore, it's important that they need to be a part of, of that uh, community and participate. So their mission uh, as part of the company highlights open source. We revolutionise the way companies use open source technologies. Open source is part of their mission. It's part of their values. It's highlighting to the company, hey, open source is where we are. Open source is good. Open source participation is great. Right? So, um, you can imagine uh, my apprehension when last year uh, Instacluster got acquired by NetApp. Right? And NetApp is uh, a company that has a lot of products, a lot of fun functionalities, and most of the products that they, they have are not open source. Right? So it's sort of like, hey, right, we've got a company that's not an open source, an openly uh, open source company acquiring an open source company. What's going to happen? You know, how, how is that going to work? And because they acquired an open source company, does that mean suddenly that, that NetApp's open source story, acqui they acquired Instacluster. So now NetApp's open source story started in 2012, 13, because they bought Instacluster and they've adopted that open source history. Well, no, I don't think that's realistic to, to, to say that. But does NetApp have an open source story? Well, yes, they do. Because they were founded in 1992, right? And a key product that they, were, that they were founded on contains code from BSD Unix, right? Open source. So they open source story. They've got an open source story, right? But so, but one of the things, but one of the things I said is that, you know, hey, you can tell what happens about your open source story when you, you stand here and you look back. Right? So although the product was founded on BSD Unix, it wasn't dependent, there was no urgency, there was no external uh, participation for the, for the product because they weren't dependent on the upstream community. So therefore they sort of forked the project and went and, 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 and did other things to that. So it meant that the participation was limited. I'm not saying it didn't exist, because I think it did, but it was limited because it wasn't as um, active as the participation that we have if you've, you're dependent on open source as part of your business. So therefore, you, we, we, you sort of look at that and you say, well, okay, well, 
how do we work together? How do we look at um, aligning what is happening between these two com companies? And, 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 and you, 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 as I say, the, the, the culture and the, the, um, the, the apprehension was, you know, hey, do we have to stop working on open source now? I mean, it, it, I mean, I, I, I'm saying it because, I, I, you know, this is a, a concern that people will think, you know, hey, no, we don't have to, we can't work on open source anymore. But that wasn't the case. So one of the things that um, we found as we started to, to, to look at working um, together with, uh, with sort of NetApp um, is that, you know, we were a company of, say, like 300, 350 people, that's like startup. A NetApp was a company of 11,000, right? So if you, if you move from one sort of scale to the other, there are processes for everything. And because there has to be, because you've got a, a lot more at stake. So we have pro there's processes in place for, for, for everything, including open source. So one of the things that um, we, uh, we found was, you know, that Insta, the Insta cluster, because it was dependent on open source products, didn't really have, I think, uh, what, what we call secret source to leak, so IP. But NetApp, because they built up a whole load of products, and I think this was mentioned before in quite a few of the talks, hey, you know, um, the risk, uh, risk, risk mitigation, risk, risk averseness, in the sense that if you've developed something that you want to protect, you don't want to use or allow an open source channel to leak that, that, that work, that IP, into the public domain. So this is the reason why there was so the processes, compliance processes in place around open source. Okay? So one of the things, I'll give you an example of, of one of the things that we, we, we came across. Um, so if you've got a compliance process, a risk compliance process that is uh, set up for, I say, um, sporadic or infrequent uh, open source contributions, what happens when you acquire an open source company that's used to a velocity of in open source contributions a lot faster than the process was set up for? And there seemed to be, right, okay, hold on. Oh, we're, we're going to have a problem, we're going to have a problem, we can't compositipate. But the fact that this was flagged up front, hey, look, we've got a concern. We actively participate in these projects, right? They're external upstream projects. They're low risk. We have no IP to leak. Can we have some sort of fast track process, pre-approval to work on these projects? And that was the solution that we had, which was great. So it, that was a way of, you know, seeing that, hold on, we've got a situation that didn't happen before. But now, because of that acquisition, because of the different ways of working, we've now got put to get work together to find a solution for that problem. And I think that was a, 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 a good feeling for both companies in the sense that, hey, look, we're starting to work together to actually do something to help um, you know, move us forward and to understand this sort of open source journey. The next slide, I think uh, Jim mentioned this uh, in, the, in the last um, uh, talk in, in his question. So the, um, I don't know how many of you know about the To Do group. So they are a, a group that, um, that works at, to provide resources around open source uh, participation and the creation of open source program offices. So they have a, um, an open source, um, open source uh, project office maturity model. And I've really quite simplified it here because I didn't want to go into too much detail and whatever. But generally, I've put some examples of the levels that they have in that maturity model and what it means. So, you know, the, original, the, the, the level zero adopting open source ad hoc sounds a little bit like the proactive approach. I think most companies probably don't really want to go there. And the serious companies don't really want to go there. Um, so it real, the, the, the first level really starts at, at one, which is around open source compliance and inventory and developer education. Right. And when we look at this, this model, we see that, you know, okay, um, 
uh, NetApp has been putting together processes around providing open source compliance and inventory and highlighting to the developers around the open source licensing that are acceptable and maybe not so, not so, so good because of the, the potential leak, right? But if you look at, uh, say, Instacluster, so I work in developer relations. I have two technical uh, uh, evangelists talking about using open source solutions. They, we, we participate in the ecosystem. So if you look at that, then the company that was acquired is actually more in the level two than the company that was, was the acquirer, which is an interesting situation. And I think this is something that is not unique, right? Another thing to note is that NetApp are actually a to-do group member. Instacluster were not, right? So the company that was working on open source, not involved in to-do group, the company that has limited open source participation and experience is in the to-do group. And the fact that they're a member of to-do group actually tells us something. It tells us that they're interested. It tells us that they're wanting to do more. It tells us that they're hoping and, and keen to do more, but perhaps may not have the capability or the resources or the knowledge. Well, maybe not until now, because the acquisition of the company, uh, we have uh, the, the acqu acquired company now has some open source, quite a lot of open source knowledge. So what you've got the situation here is that the acquired company is actually trying to help mentor the acquirer. And if you think about that, I think that's a really nice story. Because um, you know, I was talking to somebody this morning and they were saying, hey, you know, acquisitions, it's like assimilation, right? Um, and so it feels like you lose the unique piece of you as you, you get acquired. But in this case, right? We're working together to try and find the best of both worlds, to try and use these resources to try and understand what's going on. Okay. So look what we found. So we started, so one of the things that we started doing, right, um, is it's sort of coming up to nearly a year since uh, the acquisition took place. So I think we, the acquisition took place in May uh, last year. Um, and one of the things that I've been doing um, is contacting people and trying to find out what's happening in open source around the whole company. I've been in meetings, I've been chasing people. Anybody that mentions anything to do with open source, I'm, on, I'm sending an email, I'm on the phone to them, hey, what are you doing, what are you doing? You know? Um, and we're trying to pull the people um, that, are, that are working on open source, maybe in isolation, uh, in, in pockets together to try and build that sort of network. Because I think that's the way um, that we can look at moving forward. And so one of the things that we, I found out, or some of the things that I found out as part of that conversation is that there's some potential gaps, right? And some of the gaps that we found, uh, I've got them listed here, but I'll, I'll, I'll run through them. So, one of them was around, you know, open source strategy. So, right, what, so what we're looking for here are things that will help align the two companies to try and highlight if there's anything that can help us, you know, align better, work together, um, build our knowledge, um, do uh, good work in, in, in the open source ecosystem. So the first piece that we found is, right, uh, open source strategy. We haven't got an open source strategy. If, if you, a few slides back, when we looked at the sort of like the, the mission and goals for the companies, Instacluster had open source in there. Uh, NetApp had, you know, data, hybrid cloud. So one of the things that we want to do is to try and um, understand what is the role of open source in NetApp? You know, what sort of value do we see in, in, in open source? And how do we communicate that internally and externally? So we're looking at working on this, this strategy. Um, uh, coordination, I, I mentioned that I was working and trying to find all the people that were working on open source. Today, we don't really have visibility about all the open source initiatives that are happening in one place. If somebody said, hey, right, okay, tell me what's happening across the board, across the company around open source, 
we wouldn't be able to say. We would have to contact various people to say, hey, what's going on? Uh, communication. So what's happening with open source? You know, what, so if you, if, you, if you Google or search for NetApp and open source, you don't find very much. But they are doing some things in the space. There's, they're releasing some projects on, on, on GitHub. They're doing some open source work. But there's nothing that's actually promoting or telling us about that work. So I think that they're, you know, communication internally and also externally. Participation. So one of the things that I mentioned that is, you know, Instagram was were really keen to sort of participate in the open source uh, ecosystem. And one of the things that we can do is to try and educate and help uh, the developers, the wider developers, understand how they can participate um, and how they can engage. Because I know that there's like a lot of talk about, you know, hey, getting started with your first contribution and whatever. And that's OK at a, maybe an ind individual level. But when you think about a company or a corporate level, it becomes a bit more difficult. So we need to get executive buy-in. And I think, you know, people have mentioned, hey, you need to get a, an executive sponsor. You need to try and make sure that, you know, throughout the business, that the, it has um, a, a, strong, a strong message about this is where we want to go. So these are some of the, the things that we've, we've, we've found. And I think that, you know, the predicament of some of the of, of, of corporates, large corporates, is that, you know, hey, they, a lot of the solutions can be quite complex, right? And trying to incorporate the open source participation in that, or open source engagement or open source communication can be difficult. But now, as I say, that we have this, this um, situation where we've got some open source knowledge, knowledge coming into the company through an acquisition, I think it's important that we try and use that to the best of the advantage for the company. So, so setting out on the journey. So some of the things that I mentioned before, uh, the strategy that we're, that we're working on, the coordination, uh, communication. Some of the other things that we found out, found that were sort of gaps was around education. Um, compliance was already taken care of. So even though we've got a compliance process, a really strong, and robust compliance process, it, we don't have an open source program office. And if you look at all the things that the tasks that we're looking at trying to have identified that need to be done, it seems to point to the fact that you know, an open source program office could be a great way to consolidate that work, to coordinate that work, to report on that work, to, 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 to be a, 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 an internal, external facing, internal facing way of understanding and dealing with open source. So that is what we're, 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 we're working on at the moment. That is where we're looking to go. And I say, you know, it's, it's complicated because of the, the, the breadth of all the different functionalities and products. It was simple when we were a startup and had open source products. But now, when, you, when you're in a larger corporation, it's always been, it's difficult to scale some of those processes and solutions. So it's a, it's a, it's a day to day journey. And as I say, this is the beginning of the, the, of the journey. We don't know how it's going to evolve. This is where, 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 we, where we'd like to go, but we don't know where they're going to get there. So similar to the previous talk about, hey, you know, we've, we've, we've identified sort of where we want to go. We're trying to build buy-in and get buy-in. And we're trying to identify how we can move things forward. So, so where do we go from here and how, what can we do to sort of fill those gaps? So, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, the, the company now has a really, really complex portfolio. So we have the open source stuff, we've probably got open core stuff, we've got proprietary stuff. You know, how do we communicate that? Because there's all different audiences. How do we integrate that? It's not sort of open source company, non-open source company. We don't have, it, it doesn't happen anymore. It's always a mix, it's always a, um, a it, it, it's, it's like a gray area. It's like different, it, it, it's like a scale, right? 
there's all these different functionalities. And there is no one size that fits all. You can't, you can't just sit there and say, hey, yeah, if you do X, Y, Z, everything will be fine. It's a journey. It's an evolving thing. We need to find out you know, how can it work for us. You know, and like in the example with the with the, the process around the compliance process, you know, we got we're going to have some pain points, right? And by identifying those pain points, that's going to help us evolve. One of the things that we really want to do is to try and raise awareness and bring that open that um, participation across the business, right? So you know that involves a lot of communication. That involves you know trying to get out there participate at events like maybe this one <laughs> and, 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 and tell people what's, what's happening because you know if, if we don't communicate then people don't know and I think um, there's a lot of other companies that are probably going through the same story that we're going through and I think this is a way that we can sort of share knowledge and we can help each other and we can see how we can um, work through it all together. I mean I want um, so NetApp to be more engaged in, in, in open source. I mean, I love open source. I'm uh, really passionate about open source. So, you know, that's my motivation in the sense that, hey, look, I want to still keep working on open source. So um, I want to see how we, we can move forward on our journey, our open source journey. So our next steps, right, so we've identified these gaps uh, we highlighted, and we need to sort of align the strategy. So we need to sort of... Um, we have now identified an uh, uh, executive sponsor. We have two executive sponsors. Uh, Paul mentioned two. So we have one, fr one from the, 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 the sort of InstaCluster side of the business, and we have one from the NetApp side of the business, which is really, really good, because I think you need to have the buy-in from an executive at both of those, both of those levels. Um, we need to understand and communicate what we're doing. So, so that people understand you know, where we are, how, where we are in the process, how, how they can help, if they have any knowledge or ideas that can help us move forward. I mean, we need to start coordinating the, the open source knowledge, because that knowledge, as I say, we want to make it into a, a, a more widely available, sort of internally, um, and making sure that people understand the value that they can get from either open source participation, from being part of the ecosystem, from just learning new skills and just understanding the value. So we want to look at setting up this open source program office because we don't have one, right? We have, a, we have compliance, yes, but we don't have that open source program office. So one of the things that we would like to do is to try and see how we can set that up. And I think that the challenge that we're going to have, especially in the economic environment, is, is around resourcing. Because, you know, a lot of companies have, have, have uh, had, to had staff reductions. So it's more about trying to see whether we can adapt some of the work that the OSPO would need to do and try and find internal resources that already have that capability. And I think we've identified some people that have. And I think that it's probably easy for us to try and start out small and see how we go. So set up some sort of proof of concept um, and then have some sort of way of measuring to see the success of, you know, hey, what can we do here? Um, have some metrics and see, show some value that the open, open source program office could provide. So that's where I, I see us going, I hope. As I say, it's a bit of a uh, it's not an imaginary tale, this is a real tale, this is real, um, that's happening. So that's where I see us going. So um, one of the things that I really, really wanted to call out here, you know, being acquired doesn't mean that you can't be the mentor, right? You can't, if, you, if your company has specialist knowledge around certain details or uh, skills, then you can mentor the acquiring organisation. And don't be afraid to call that out and say, hey, look, we do have this capability. We can help. And I think that is an important piece because it's not about assimilation, right? It's about creating a way forward together by merging the, technology, the knowledge and the skills and the resources to come out on the other side a better, a better uh, joint company that has more knowledge, more understanding, hopefully, of open source and how to participate.